welcome to today's webinar. I am Skylar with Lean Frontiers, and on the screen, you can also see our presenter for the day, Dr. Michael Yurek. You will receive a link to view the recording. Please allow us 24 to 48 hours to process the webinar. Don't forget, the TWI and Kata Summit are coming up in March. Also, I would like to take a moment to introduce our facilitator for the day, Dr. Michael Yurek has presented throughout four continents, co-edited or authored six books on leadership and is associate editor for the Measuring Business Excellence and Leadership and Management Journals. He is also the editor of the Exploring Effective Leadership Practices Through Popular Culture book series. With that, I will hand it over to him. You can take over. Okay, great. Thank you, Skylar. Appreciate it. Uh, and hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, great great to, uh, to have you here in this session entitled Leadership, Culture, and Operational Excellence. So excited to be here. Um, a lot of what I'm going to share with you today, uh, as Skylar mentioned, I do a lot of research in, in leadership, uh, but I also do a lot of research in culture as well. And I direct our program, our master's program uh, in management, focused in operational excellence uh, here at St. Vincent College um, in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is based on my philosophy uh, surrounding the research that I've been involved with, uh, but also as director of that program in operational excellence. So what I thought we could start with is maybe just talking about an agenda. Um, leadership and excellence mean different things to different people. So what I thought we might start with is just defining what those uh, terms mean. Similarly, organizational culture uh, means something different to different people. So I thought we'd, we'd also define that before going into more detail of what I mean by culture, uh, including its importance, uh, including some elements of culture, and then kind of wrapping this all together and talking a bit about cultures of excellence. So in other words, what are some of those specific things that make a culture truly excellent? Or what are some attributes of a culture that give it that at that air of, of excellence. And throughout, we're gonna be talking about how leaders can influence that culture as well. Um, I should mention this, uh, Skylar, I believe is, is going to be monitoring the Q&A and the chat. So we'll, we'll be doing questions and answers and, and have a bit of discussion, hopefully at the end. Uh, so as uh, I'm talking, as we're, we're going through this stuff, if you wanna leave some messages in the chat or some questions in the Q&A, please go ahead and do that. And, and hopefully we'll be able to get to those uh, at the end of the session uh, today, if that sounds good to everybody. All right, well, let's jump in. Leadership. There are so many definitions of leadership. And some definitions I like and some definitions I don't like. Uh, one of the ones that I, I do like uh, is by Richard Daft. Um, and this person says, Daft says, leadership is a process of influencing followers process of influencing followers is actually a second part to that as well and that is actually uh not being influenced not having undue influence in return so in other words i'm going to influence others if i'm a leader if i'm a successful leader effective leader i'm going to influence others uh to do something uh towards action while at the same time if there's something that i don't want to do i'm going to resist that unwanted influence so leadership is um it's a process. It's an activity. We're influencing others to do something. And that's not to say that we're influencing the, them to do something they don't want to do. But the best leaders, I think if we're looking especially at a transformational or servant leadership model, the best leaders are, are influencing followers to do something that benefits the common good, the group as a whole, in other words, uh, to work together towards uh, mutually accountable goals. Now, excellence, and this is coming from uh, someone that, that runs, uh, again, an operational excellence graduate program. But OE, I like to look at it as a management philosophy. And, you know, lean OE, I, I kind of use those terms somewhat interchangeably. There's, there's very um, many similarities between those two terms. I know that uh, in practice, they're not 100% exactly the same, but I think they're probably close enough for the purposes of, of today's webinar uh, and our topic. Because whenever I think of OE, I think of it really as focused on three key areas. Continuous improvement. So in other words, always doing better or at least striving to do better uh, today than you did yesterday and hoping that tomorrow is even better than that. And so improving our processes so that they become uh, more reliable, 
uh, more sustainable, more predictable. And that's the idea of continuous improvement. I think that's uh, an element of both lean and OE. Waste reduction is another one. Getting rid of that stuff in our processes and in our organizations uh, that is not value added. Um, and so that's, that's a part of uh, what I mean whenever I say excellence as well. And of course, problem solving. Knowing and being able to get to the root cause for problem, not just putting a, a Band-Aid on something uh, that's a symptom uh, of the real problem, but actually getting to the root, the root cause to try and solve the problem that might be systemic in our organization or the problems that might be systemic in our organizations. That's the idea of problem solving. And I would suggest that both are related to organizational culture in a variety of different ways. We need to understand the environment. And, and by environment, when we think about an internal environment, that, that's our culture. Right? And our context is part of our organization's culture. And so if I'm going to lead effectively and successfully, I need to understand my culture. Well, we also need to understand the current environment to move towards excellence. And I'm sure you've experienced this, but there's a stigma with OE. There's a stigma with lean. You've probably seen this in your organizations. As organizations attempt to move towards lean or move to, towards OE, there's a lot of resistors there. A lot of people don't want to engage uh, in, in that change. I encounter this all the time in the classroom. In the graduate program, I teach a course on organizational culture. And we also have courses on change management and a variety of other um, areas related to OE and, and leadership. But one of the things I oftentimes encounter is a student uh, will say, you know, I've been working in my organization maybe for a decade or more even, and I've seen it all. And yeah, I get the value of lean. I get the value of OE. I understand that. But but for whatever reason, in every lean implementation that I've seen in, in my current organization or in other organizations, it has failed. People do not embrace it. Why? And, and it's getting to the idea of culture. So I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here. But it's because in many implementations of lean, what happens is leaders focus on the artifacts. And, and I'll, I'll share with you what I mean by that in a couple of seconds, rather than the values and the assumptions. Okay, so I want to put that in our mind uh, as, as we keep going. And I'll share with you a little bit of more detail about artifacts, assumptions, and values. And I'll share with you why just trying to adjust those artifacts of a culture uh, won't work in terms of moving us towards a, an excellent culture or a lean culture. But to be able to understand those three levels of culture, artifacts, values, and assumptions, we have to define what a culture is. Culture, leadership, excellence, I love these terms because they're so um, <laughs> general and vague. They can mean so many different things to many different people. But I like to think of culture as those things that encompass key values, beliefs, and attitudes. These are things that people in our organizations share. Ways of thinking, mindsets. They set the norms for, the culture sets the norms for appropriate activities uh, in our organization. The culture sets the norms for um, ways to behave, uh, appropriate responses. Uh, culture is a very pervasive and a strong influence on behavior. And so as we think about what cultures uh, we work in, I'd like us to reflect a little bit on, on how the cultures that we work in really influence our mindset and our behaviors. And I have two images represented here of, of organizations that I wanna point out that I think possess strong cultures. Perhaps you know of individuals that have worked uh, at Disney or at Google, but I would argue that those are pretty strong cultures. And the thing about strong cultures is, yes, everybody thinks the same, um, maybe engages in similar behaviors, but there's this issue of fit with the culture. Sometimes that can be a good thing in having a strong culture because everyone thinks the same way and maybe we could be more efficient, but we don't always also get new ideas. And if somebody doesn't fit the mindset of the culture, they might leave that organization. And that's kind of scary if that person may be a strong contributor. So when we think about strong versus weak cultures, we want to think that, uh, you know, those things as well. I have pictured here two examples of strong cultures just to get us thinking about those things. But when we think about why culture is important, it's an informal system of control. And 
I'm not saying that to sound like culture is devious or anything like that. It's not. Every organization has a culture and every organization's culture presents a system of control. Um, if you think about how your culture sets your behaviors or sets the expectations uh, that others have of you in your organization, that's a system of control. This gets us basically to be able to be on the same page, to move in a particular direction. So the fact that a, a culture is an informal system of control basically means that, you know, as you're showing up to work one day, not everyone's having a party. You know, it's not like a free for all. And that's a good thing. It's an informal uh, system of control because it shows what expected and normal work behaviors should be within a certain context. As such, it's a social order. Uh, it's a way that we understand things. So it's a system of shared meaning. If you want to summarize it very easily or very succinctly, a culture represents the way things are done around here. I don't know about you, uh, but in my organization, you know, sometimes you look at a process and you think, why are we doing it this way? And sometimes when you question that, there might be someone who's been with the organization for, for many years that would say, well, that's just the way we've always done it. That's culture speaking. Uh, that is a behavior. Those are, are activities that have been so ingrained through the culture because they've been normalized, because the culture has told us this is the way to do something. And so a culture really represents, it's behind that statement, if you ask somebody, why? Why are we doing this? It's behind the statement that they might say, as well, that's because it's the way we've always done things. It's the way things are done here. Uh, as such, then, I think, you know, uh, you're, you're getting the point that I'm trying to make, is that culture represents the forces that normalize appropriate behavior. Again, this stabilizes an organization for predictability. As a system of control, we're trying to predict others' behaviors in that organization. And so, you know, again, we don't want that free-for-all. We don't want a party. We want people to do their job. We want people to, to work uh, in our organizations. And so this culture basically allows us to figure out what each person does in their context. But there's also an influence on process. Certainly, organizations that embrace excellence uh, will have efficient processes will have reliable processes. And so if we think of process as an artifact of culture, because it highlights what's important to that culture, certainly culture has an influence on organizational processes. Um, I'm not sure if this is all making sense just yet, but I think it's going to be a little bit clearer when I start talking about the three different elements of culture. And this comes from uh, famous uh, cultural researcher, Edgar Schein, says there's really three levels. Artifacts, values, and assumptions. Um, let's start with the artifacts because I think they're the easiest to see. They're like uh, the proverbial tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Artifacts are physical manifestations of the culture. These are things that we can experience with the five senses. We see these things. Um, we hear these things. And so, you know, when you go to work, think about your workplace layout. Think about the type of building you're walking into. Think about the art that might be hanging on the wall in the lobby. Think about the stories that people in your organization tell, the things that are important to talk about. Those are all artifacts of the culture. Now, the funny thing about artifacts is they're built upon the values. Artifacts are a reflection of what an organization cares about. Values are the ideologies, ideals, goals, aspirations. Um, I work in a Catholic Benedictine liberal arts uh, institution of high learning. Our values are very much related to liberal arts, uh, the Benedictine monastic community here on campus, and uh, Catholic values. And you see that then in the artifacts. You know, one part of our culture of the Benedictine uh, approach to education is the idea of conversation and hospitality. Well, in our, in our classes, they're very much uh, discussion-based. They're very small, so we can have those discussions. Our cafeteria on campus is called the community center to really embrace that value of community. That's an artifact that's very much linked with the value. And so I would encourage you to think about your own organizations. How are the things you experience, the five senses, the artifacts linked with what the organization cares about, the values of the organization? Now, assumptions are a little bit more difficult to understand, I think, because we just don't talk about them. 
Assumptions are unconscious, taken for granted ideas or concerns. These are things that we really care about. They might often be traced to the founder of the company, of the organization, but these are the things, they're almost like values that are held so deeply in an organization that we forget about them. We talk about the values. Uh, we explicitly state the values sometimes, value statements, but the assumptions, not always, because they're so deeply held. It's like our worldview. It's like our mindset that everybody just agrees upon so strongly that we don't even talk about them. Yet, those assumptions drive the values. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example of an assumption. It's difficult to do because organizations typically don't articulate them. But one could be something like, uh, um, you know, uh, a happy and healthy employee is a productive employee. That's an assumption. Now, you're not going to hear people necessarily verbalize that or talk about that in an organization uh, as part of the values. But if that's an assumption of management, yeah, it's going to drive some of the values, which again are going to drive some of the artifacts of a culture. So hopefully we see the link between these three areas. I like to think of cultures oftentimes like an iceberg. Okay. Assumptions are well below the surface of the water. There's a lot of ice there. On top of those assumptions are frozen the values. Still a lot of ice there. But sticking through the water, sticking on top of the water, emerging from the water, I guess is a better way to put that, that little tip of the iceberg are the artifacts, what we see. Now, why I like this analogy is because it relates to uh, the example of the Titanic, okay? If I'm the captain of the Titanic, I'm gonna be sailing my boat down the water, down in the ocean, and I'm gonna see this little piece of chunk of ice on top of the water. And I'm gonna think, I'm just gonna push that piece of ice. I'm gonna push it right out of the way. But guess what? I'm gonna crash. I'm gonna wreck the ship because underneath that piece of ice, are the values and the assumptions. And they're telling me to stop that change. <laughs> so when I think of that in the context of moving towards a culture of excellence, that's exactly what we're talking about. I can put all the continuous improvement, problem solving, waste reduction tools that I want, throw them to people in my organization, see what sticks on the wall. Those are artifacts. But guess what? If they're not supported by the values and the assumptions of the organization, they're going to fail. This is why lean and OE initiatives fail, because they're not linked to the values, the assumptions, the deeply held beliefs and ideals of the organization. And so let's say I'm, I'm that champion of lean or that champion of OE, and I'm going to push those artifacts. I want to change those artifacts of my current organization to be more lean or OE focused. So I'm just going to move my ship into that and just kind of gently nudge it. And the organization is going to hopefully move right along with me and accept those things. Absolutely not because there's the values and the assumptions underneath the water. They're gonna put a stop to that right away. To really embrace lean, to really embrace OE, you need to change the values and the assumptions, not just the artifacts, okay? Hopefully this is making a little bit more sense here. I also like to think though, of cultures not just as an iceberg, but also as a fishbowl, in terms of how much it influences uh, an employee behavior, people's behaviors in our organizations. So you might say, okay, fine. So we'll change the values. We'll change the assumptions. That should be easy. That's very hard to do. Very hard to do. Because once people are normalized to think a certain way or behave a certain way, that doesn't change very quickly. Um, growing up, I used to love going to the carnivals. And I used to love that game. Maybe you've played this game yourself or, or with your kids or, or grandkids or, or whatnot or, or whenever you were a kid. We have that, that ping pong ball. And you, you throw the ping pong ball and you try and get it in a fishbowl. And if you get it in a fishbowl, you win that little goldfish that's swimming around in there. Hopefully some of you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I'd like to put myself in the mind of that fish, that goldfish, as I think about cultures. Okay, I've just been wanted this carnival. They put me in this plastic bag and I'm moving to a new fishbowl. Great. I've been swimming in a fishbowl all my life. I know what it's like to swim in a fishbowl. I'm going to be comfortable in this new environment and this new culture. Now, anyone that switched jobs knows that's not going to happen. That's not the case. You're dumped into that new fishbowl and holy crap, this water is colder than I thought it was going to be, or this water is warmer than I thought it's going to be, or this gravel looks different, or no, there's not a castle in this one. There's a treasure chest because the artifacts of the culture are different. 
but the values, the assumptions might also be different. In other words, what we're swimming in, the culture is different. And so as you're dumped into that new fishbowl, you experience culture shock because you're not used to it. And that's exactly what we experience here. Now, what I also like to think and, and why I'm bringing this up right now is, you know, I know it's, uh, <laughs> Scott and I were just talking before the session here and it's nice weather where I'm at, um, actually kind of sunny and warm, but we're supposed to get a lot of snow, but tomorrow, but picture yourself in the summer where it's really warm, really nice, and you're able to go swimming. That first time you jump in the, in the, uh, in the pool or the lake or wherever you're swimming or the ocean, it's cold, right? It's really cold. Well, what happens is once you've been in the, in the, in the water over time, your body adjusts to it, right? So that you no longer even realize you're swimming. So you're that fish in the new fishbowl. You get dropped in the new fishbowl. It's really cold right now. But once you've been in there for a couple hours, you don't even realize you're swimming anymore. That's how strong a culture is. Once you've been in that culture for a certain time, you don't even realize how much effect it's have, uh, it has on your behavior. And so as we're trying to then move a culture towards lean that, that has not adopted lean before, people have been swimming in that same fishbowl and they're so used to the culture that they're not able to adjust to it right away. That's culture shock if we do that. And so we need to ease them into that. We need to try and find a way to do that. And we do that through proper leadership, of course. But let's talk about if we want to move our culture more to be a culture of excellence, what are some of the, uh, cult the artifacts of that culture? Well, there are a few. First, a challenging vocabulary. I hear this a lot uh, as I talk to my students and I, and I do some consulting and they'll say, oh, you know, I don't think we can ever move to lean, move to excellence because I just can't get these terms down. They're so, they're so tough to memorize and, and understand what they mean. My response to them is this, forget the terms then. Call it what you want. Call it what fits your culture, your context. You have to link these artifacts to what you care about. So if you can find a, a name or a title for these, these, you know, a Kanban or an, or, or an Andon uh, or, or whatever you want to call uh, your problem-solving methodology, change it. Change it so it fits your context. Make it real to the people in your organization. We don't have to keep that vocabulary just because it's what Toyota used or because it's what Subaru uses or it's whatever XYZ organization uses it or it's what you've read about uh, in a book about lean. You can change it, change that vocabulary to make it fit your context. But of course, with artifacts of cultures, there are also tools that we're using, problem solving tools, waste elimin uh, elimination and process improvement tools and standardization tools. And so those are the things that we want our, the people in our organizations to embrace. But again, if we just put those out there without changing the, the values and the assumptions, they're not going to last. What ends up happening in those types of organizations is the same old ice will refreeze on top of it. The same old artifacts will eventually refreeze because we haven't really changed the values and the assumptions. But yet, this is ultimately what we want to move to, these artifacts. Now, there's a lot going on on this slide, I understand. Many of this, much of this, I'm sure uh, you're very familiar with as well, but these are some values of cultures of excellence. I want to uh, really share with you some of these. Uh, if we really want an, ex uh, a, an organization focused on excellence, we have to do a couple of things. We have to care about a couple of things. And this is why becoming truly excellent, truly embracing lean holistically is quite a challenge for many organizations. One is because we have to be focused on quality to customers. That's one of the major points of lean or OE, right? Why do we want to be excellent? Well, because we want to, we want to provide, we want to pass that on. If we have a reliable process, that means we're going to have a consistent quality. So we want to pass that quality on to customers. By the way, this doesn't mean that our, our product or service has to be the number one quality in the world. This is about the quality and the consistency that our customers demand. Okay. And so that's what, what we're talking about here with values. We need to care about that. The other thing we need to care about is actually no layoffs. One of the major things I hear, and I'm sure you've heard this as well, is that my organization doesn't want to move to lean or to be excellent because what happens? We get better and better. We continuously improve. Uh, that means headcount reduction, right? Well, and truly uh, excellent organizations, 
and organizations that truly embrace lean, they provide that level of security to their employees and they say, we'll find work for you. Now that's easier said than done, of course. Uh, if that's the case, this tends and seems to work best in organizations that have sort of a, a growth trajectory. Um, but that is really what we need to, to provide uh, if we're going to really have our people embrace lean and OE. We also care about flexible stability. This is kind of interesting, and I've, I've done some research on this and wrote a little bit about different lines of thinking as it relates to flexible stability. But we want to reduce variation through standardization, but standards can change. So in other words, employees, if they see a better way of doing part of their process, need to be able uh, to change that. So it's the standard until it can or needs to be changed. So this idea of flexible stability. Uh, obviously, we also have the value of 6S, sort, straighten, scrub, systematize uh, safety and sustain. We all know the, the different types of MUDA or waste. Uh, we have that value of, of trying to get rid of as much MUDA or waste as we possibly can. And of course, the value of visual management, you know, th representing things uh, pictorially. Um, Genshi Genbatsu, going, going and seeing, going straight to the source as we're encountering, encountering an issue or a problem. These are all values, things that a culture of excellence would care about. And hopefully you can see some of those values being replicated in the tools we've talked about. And even in what some of that challenging vocabulary that we shared about and on, combine, et cetera, uh, represent. But the values are the middle part between the artifacts and the assumptions. And I would suggest this, all of these values really come from two things. And if these are not our assumptions at the core of our organization, lean will not be embraced. And so as a leader, you need to make sure this is what our people truly care about. Respect for people. We care about people. Well, wait a second. How does that relate to the values? Let's take a look at this. If we care about our customers, we want to provide the quality they want, right? Yeah, caring for people. If we care about people, we're providing job security, right? That's, that's part of the values. Well, if we care for people, that's part of 6S, right? Why do we want a safe environment? Well, so our employees don't get hurt. So our people don't get hurt on the job. Uh, you know, all of these things, in other words, seem like there's some linkage in some way to respect for people. And of course, also the idea of continuous improvement, always wanting to do better. That's why we engage in waste management to try and take out non-value added activities to do better. That's why we engage in visual management to really see we, who we are and what we're doing and what our process is so that we can get better. We need these two assumptions at the bottom of our iceberg so that those values will freeze on top of them so then the artifacts of an excellent culture will freeze on top of them. Hopefully this is making sense to everybody. I know whenever we first start talking about such a, an abstract idea of culture, it seems to me that, that there's a lot of heads that, that kind of get scratched there thinking, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure where this is going, but I think now by the time we get to this level of culture, we start to see the importance of culture as it relates to lean, as it relates to operational excellence. Now, tying this into leadership a bit, since this is a, a topic, since this is a webinar on leadership, I want to share with you a, an example of why leaders are important, uh, specifically uh, as it relates to culture. To be successful, a leader needs to fit that person's environment. I don't know if anyone knows uh, who this picture is. This is, I, I'm, I'm a novice musician on the side. Oh, someone raised their hand. <laughs> um, th this is uh, Glenn Miller for the person to raise their hand. I don't know actually how to respond to that. I'm sorry. I, I'm only working on one screen today. Um, this is Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller was a famous uh, big band leader um, who actually disappeared over the English Channel en route to a performance uh, when he was what he was with the uh, U.S. Army, what would become uh, the branch of the military called the Air Force. He was on his way to perform over the English Channel near Christmas in 1944, and his plane just disappeared. But the interesting thing about Glenn Miller, a couple of interesting things, his band went on without him at that performance. He disappeared, didn't show up, but his band still played without him. Actually, his band is still going to this day. Now, of course, all different members, people came and went, passed away. <clears throat> so a whole new generation of players. 
but the Glenn Miller Orchestra is still playing. And if you haven't heard of Glenn Miller, by the way, uh, after this webinar, please please Google or YouTube Glenn Miller. I guarantee you've heard some of those songs, even if it's just from a movie or a TV show or, or, or something. Uh, you're familiar with Glenn Miller's music. What, and again, I think, you know, the point of this is Glenn Miller was an effective leader that his, you know, they say that one measure of an effective leader is, will your organization last after you're gone? And with the Glenn Miller Orchestra, certainly, uh, they were winning Grammy Awards after he left. Well, Glenn Miller also knew his environment, his context. If you think about what Glenn Miller, what made Glenn Miller popular, and he was the number one, the most popular band uh, during his time, during his life. He understood his contacts and he understood the culture of his organization and he understood where he fit within that. Glenn Miller is always pictured with one of two things, either a trombone or a cigarette, sometimes both. Um, the interesting thing was, even though he's always pictured with a trombone, he wasn't a great trombone player. Uh, and um, he was an avid smoker, though. I saw Kathy just uh, write in here the Glenn Miller story with Jimmy Stewart is a good example. You're right, Kathy, uh, it is a good example. It hits some of that, that particular movie hits some of the major points of, of Glenn Miller's life. It actually is, you probably wouldn't um, be surprised, a bit sensationalized and, and not quite accurate. It does make Glenn Miller out to be, well, he's played by Jimmy Stewart. So it does make Glenn Miller out to be kind of a nicer guy than he actually probably was in, in real life. Um, but it does hit some of the major uh, points of, of Glenn Miller's life, a little bit fictionalized, of course. But it does get some of those points as well. What the Glenn Miller story does, as Kathy points out, though, is talk about Glenn Miller's unique sound. What made Glenn Miller famous was he had this harmony within his reed section so that they were all able to play. It was it was very harmonious. You know, if you listen to a Glenn Miller song to this day, you're going to hum that melody after you heard it. You're going to you're going to you're going to know it. He created a unified and he was patriotic, too, but his band, his music was was sort of more unifying in nature and just the way it sounded. Now, if you contrast that with some of the other bands of the era that focus on individual soloists, they weren't like that. They're more about individuals working together or, or, or playing in the same band, but kind of soloing one after the other. Glenn Miller says, let's all play together. He knew he wasn't a great trombonist. So he knew he couldn't compete with the other band leaders as a soloist. So he crafted this sound that was unique to his own organization but fit with the context of what was going on around him. People were in society at large, nervous, scared. You know, when are we going to be pulled in this conflict? What's the extent that we're going to be pulled in this conflict? There's a lot of insecurity there. And Glenn Miller, through his patriotism, of course, but also through just the sound of his band, was able to create that sort of united front. And, and it's really what made him popular. Uh, but he did that because he, he understood the culture of the group that he was working with. And the culture outside the external environment as well that suggested what listeners needed uh, at that time in society. So, again, moving forward with, with leadership, leaders are, and followers are, are intricately linked together, of course. And as a leader, we want to think about who our followers are. We want to think about their willingness. We want to think about their ability. Willingness is the degree to which. Uh, followers have the motivation and the drive to attempt something. Ability is the degree to which others have the knowledge, skills, abilities, expertise to accomplish something. And so if we're trying to influence others to do something, we want to make sure they have the willingness and the ability to do that. Now, <clears throat> if we think of, of a team with high ability and high willingness, that team's great. They're firing all cylinders. But we don't always have teams like that, do we? Sometimes we have teams with high ability and variable willingness or some ability and low willingness or low ability and high willingness. What this suggests is this. One leadership approach likely will not motivate each of these teams. In other words, when we find ourselves in a certain culture or a certain context, comprised of these varying levels among our potential followers, we need to adjust our leadership style so we're best able to motivate them, best able to make the best decisions we can to fit the context. So that then hopefully we can drive those change initiatives to moving us towards a culture of excellence. And that optimal combination really depends 
on a certain level of what we call initiating structure and consideration. Uh, this, by the way, is the Hersey and Blanchard model, um, uh, sometimes called situational leadership. Um, it's also known by a couple of other things uh, as well, but it's Hersey and Blanchard that came up with this initially. Um, and this, is, this slide is just to ask a couple of reflective questions as we go through this regarding whether or not you see ability and willingness on various levels with the people that follow you in your organization and how those different levels might influence your ability to be an effective leader, as well as your organization's ability to adopt an OE culture. Now, I mentioned initiating structure and consideration. As we think about our potential followers' levels of ability and willingness, we also want to think about our own abilities uh, related to initiating structure or consideration. Maybe not abilities, is, maybe that's not the right word. Maybe it's more preferences. <clears throat> initiating structure is, is how much somebody cares about the day-to-day -day behaviors. They're concerned about process. They're concerned about productivity. That's primarily what they're worried about. Consideration, on the other hand, is more about the people side of things. Are we going to try and establish mutual trust? Are we going to respect others? Um, this is something that's communicative, somebody that recognizes others, someone that's more of a people person, I suppose. Now, as we think about our own leadership styles, we have these two different types of behaviors, these two dimensions. We can be high in both of these dimensions, low in both these dimensions, in the middle in both these dimensions, high on one, low on the other, etc. And where we come up, uh, what we come up with then is actually five different leader behavior profiles. And each one of us, by the way, has a preference for one of these profiles based on our level of initiating structure or consideration. So with telling, we have high initiating structure, low consideration. This type of leader provides specific instructions and closely supervises performance. Selling is high initiating structure, high consideration. Here we're directing, we're supporting, we're encouraging. Uh, participating is low initiating structure, high consideration. Here I'm going to sh share some ideas. Uh, I'm going to get the group to help conduct its, um, its affairs. Delegating is low initiating structure, low consideration. Here I'm kind of turning over responsibility. Last say fair leadership. I'm kind of door shut, kind of doing something different. Middle of the road is kind of right what, what, what it sounds like. Medium initiating structure, medium consideration. It's a moderate level of support, a moderate level of interpersonal care. <clears throat> I can't stress enough that there's no one best profile. You might say, wow, wait a second. I don't know if I buy that. Because selling, coaching, high initiating structure, high consideration, sounds like that might be pretty cool. Yeah, maybe. You might also say, High consideration, low initiating structure, that sounds ideal. I want my supervisor to get off my case, just let me do my job, but I want to work in a friendly uh, climate, culture. True, but I can tell you, I once worked in an organization like that, it didn't last. Why? Because we had so much fun, we didn't focus on the job at all, and we had no one really uh, watching over the fact that we weren't um, making money, in essence. That was the type of culture that we had. On the other hand, you might say, Low initiating structure, low consideration, that's terrible. What a terrible way to be a leader. Not necessarily. If you have a high performing team, all highly skilled, all self-motivated, they might not care about whether or not you're promoting consideration among the team. They might not, they might want you not to have strong initiating structure because they want you to, to kind of take a back seat as a leader. They don't want you looking over their shoulder. Uh, you know, if you think about um what a leader could do in that situation, they can be more of a figurehead, a spokesperson for the organization. They can engage in different tasks rather than perhaps micromanaging. Um, you might also say uh, telling, high initiating structure, low consideration. That sounds like a terrible place to work. This person doesn't care about me, but they're just telling me what to do all the time. For some entry level roles where, where, where it's understood that people will not be there for their entire career, but there's a particular process that must be followed every single time. Yeah, that could work. And so, you know, this, this slide doesn't show it. I wish it did. I'm going to improve the slide a little bit. But what this looks like is a, is a bell curve. 
Remember R4, R3, R2, R1, this stuff. <coughs> R4 being high ability, high willingness. R3 being high ability, variable willingness. R2 being some ability, low willingness. And R1 being low ability, high willingness. We think of a bell curve on each of those areas here. Think about uh, R4 being the low, low. R3 being the high consideration, low initiating structure. R2 being the high initiating structure, uh, high consideration. Uh, R1 being the high initiating structure, low consideration. Those are the types of potential followers that would work best in that context for each of these leader behavior fit, um, uh, leader behavior profiles rather. So in other words, if you already have that team that's firing on all cylinders, that R4, yeah, delegating works. If you have that team doesn't quite know what they're doing just yet, yeah, telling, directing could work. What I'm suggesting is this, you have to understand your context to understand where how you're going to best be a leader. That's the whole point of a Hersey and Blanchard's model is that there's not one best way to, there's not one best way to be a leader, that it depends on the context and depends on the culture. Now, Another thing to think about as we think about leadership, because leadership is about a process of influence, as we think about culture, as we think about our fit with the culture, as we think about our followers and their willingness to change, their ability to change, to embrace OE principles and, and lean principles, we then want to think about how we're going to influence them. Uh, this to me, this is from French and Raven's classic research from back in the 50s, but it really, uh, you know, even though it's like seven decades old, it really rings true to me. And hopefully you've seen some of this in your organization as well so that it rings true to you. But there are five different ways that people can become more influential in their organization. And, and again, influence means that people listen to you. Um, people do what you ask them to, in other words. Legitimate power is one base. Legitimate power basically means formal authority. You have a job title. Um, you have a place in the org structure where people report to you. And because of that, you're influential. People listen to you because you're somebody's boss. Now, reward and coercive power oftentimes come alongside with legitimate power. Reward power means um, you're able to provide something that people want. Uh, a, a pay increase, uh, a promotion, for example, uh, more paid time off. Now, coercive is the other side of that. This is somebody that's influ uh, influential because they're able to punish uh, someone or take something away from somebody. <clears throat> so coercive power is like if you, um, you know, if someone messes up on your team, you say, I'm going to transfer you to a different department or to a different team. Uh, or you uh, give somebody a pay decrease or you, uh, you fire somebody. Those all coercive power. Now, those are sort of organizationally based, but the bottom two are more interpersonally based, expert and referent power. Expert power is that base of power that's based on somebody being really skilled in a certain area. And this person is influential in a number of ways. First way is this person is likely training other people. So as they're training other people, yes, they're, they're hopefully passing on their expertise or at least parts of it, but also passing on their mindset, their way of thinking as well. And this is what helps the culture uh, to continue to exist as well. The second way this, this type of an individual high expert power is influential is because we probably need that person to continue to exist as an organization. If we lose that person, this organization will likely not function as well into the future. And referent power is that likability factor. Have you ever worked with, actually, have you ever gone to a party with somebody that just seems to be the life of the party? Everybody wants to be around that person. That's referent power. That person is able to, to elicit a strong emotional response so that people like them, want to be around them, and as a result of that, that person is influential. Now, of course, um, I would suggest the bottom two bases there are more uh, important than the top three because anyone can be a leader in an organization if you have those two bases of power. But the more bases that you possess, likely the more influential you will become, likely the more successful you'll be at leading. But and so as we're thinking about trying to move our cultures to that, to that culture of excellence that I described earlier, the more of these bases that we have, the more fit we can have within our context to then move our organization, the assumptions and the values, not just the artifacts, to a culture of excellence, the more successful we'll be in doing that. But <clears throat> it's not just about the leader. 
everybody in the organization must embrace excellence. That's the whole mindset thing. That's the assumptions thing. That's the values thing. But it's up to the leader to help influence that group in the right direction. Now, this makes it sound a little bit simple. I know that we all know it's not that simple. There's so many different things that can go on within an organization that make that more difficult. But there are certain things outside of our organization that may or may not be beyond our control as well. Our external environment uh, plays into perhaps uh, how easily we can move to a more excellence mindset. Um, but the bottom, and there's, these are all aspects of our external culture, our external environment. But the bottom line here is that a successful leader needs to balance behaviors that fit internally in the organization. So our internal culture, uh, the willingness abilities of our, of, of our employees that, that work for us, our colleagues that work with us, uh, they need to balance that with the organization with the opportunities and threats that are external to the organization as well. So I covered a lot in a short time period there. I'm actually gonna put my email address in the chat because I did not include that in the slides. Um, so if anyone wants to reach out to me, I'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, but I'll leave this time now for uh, questions or uh, comments or thoughts. Um, there's my email address I just put in the chat. I also put my website here in the, in the chat as well. Skylar, are you going to facilitate or how are we going to do this? Yes, I'm still here. Um, Perfect. I have not seen anything come through yet. Looked like someone raised their hand. I did it see just... him and then it went away. Okay. Uh, does anybody have a question? Don't see my email. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I think that just went to... Let me try that again. There's my email. Can everybody see that now? Yes. Okay. Trisha asks if a, if a copy of the presentation will be available. Uh, I think I think that's that's true, right, um, Skyler? Yeah, you can send it to me and I can provide it to everybody, yes. Okay. Uh, a lot of folks saying thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, uh, if there are no questions, any feedback that you want to provide or any thoughts, uh, always happy to hear from you. So now you do have my email address, um, michael.urich at stvincent.edu, uh, michaelurich.com. You can find me there uh, as well. You can always just Google me as well and... and uh, certainly things about the uh, graduate program here at St. Vincent would likely come up from that as well if you're interested to hear more about our approach to OE at St. Vincent as well. I am going to go ahead and wrap everything up. Okay. Don't forget, um, you will receive, oh, we have a... Um, yeah, I don't, I don't care. Richard asked if we're able to share elements of this. Yeah, I don't care if, if uh, you share some of this with your organization. I mean, uh, um, Skylar, I don't know how you feel about this, but oh, yeah, I mean, to, me, that's, to me, that's the whole point of this is to, uh, uh, to help improve organizations. So absolutely. And then you got one question that came in. What advice do you have to foreigners in leadership positions who may not share a common local culture? Well, you know, the culture that I really focused on in this session has been about organizational culture. And so, um, but every element of culture is, is like concentric circles, you know, um, a, a regional or national culture can influence an organization's culture, of course. But I think Toyota uh, is a good case example of this when they um, went to Georgetown, you know, it was, it was um, the Toyota organization, obviously based in Japan now working with U.S. culture uh, nationally, but of course the regional Kentucky culture as well, and trying to find a fit there where uh, their version of lean uh, would work with, with uh, the regional culture, the national culture of the U.S. I would say with any approach to learning about a culture, national, regional, organizational, <coughs> a lot of it is really related to immersion. Be like that fish in the fishbowl. Try and, try and find out as much as you can about it. And 
you know, that's um, a very general answer, I think. But I think it's a good one because the more you're swimming in that fishbowl, the more you become used to that culture. Uh, and the more you come to pick up on elements of the culture, to learn about those artifacts, to learn and understand about how those artifacts may be related uh, to the values and the assumptions that you're experiencing, that, that you're experiencing, but may not be talked about explicitly. Um, you know, talk with people, explore documents uh, from when the organization was was founded. That's more of the, the company culture. Um, but in terms of the local culture or, or the, the national culture, again, uh, get out and explore things, experience things. Um, make friends who can show you elements of the culture. That would be my recommendation. You have another question. How did you decide to focus on lean and OE? Well, that's a, that's, I saw that come from Ellen. That's a great question, Ellen. You know, um, <clears throat> Ellen, I'm assuming you mean in terms of my own personal career, why I decided to focus on lean and OE. Um, really, uh, I was, <coughs> by training, um, my doctorate's really focused on organizational behavior, which is more the people side of, of business. It's more about psychology and, and social psychology and how people work together and that sort of thing. When I came to St. Vincent about 10 years ago, uh, I was asked to teach some courses in the OE area. And um, so I started looking at, at what, what Lean was about, what OE was about. And what really jumped out at me was, yeah, there's all these books and tool and, and, and um, I guess blogs and, and tools for adopting Lean processes, Lean tools, et cetera. But yet, there's still challenges that organizations are facing. I, I started doing some really examination with uh, some clients that I was working with and some of my students, why that is. And it all came down to the human factor side of things. So I thought, you know, at first, um, that organizational behavior and, and the lean background seemed to be kind of separate. But I realized they were really the same thing, you know, and they could be combined to, to become quite powerful. And so that's really why I started getting into OE and lean. You know, in our program, I am not the tools guy. Uh, I am not the hands-on technical guy in terms of, you know, how to adopt specific elements of, of lean tools. Um, but I am the guy that can talk about culture and about how a culture uh, really makes or breaks whether or not you adopt lean. So um, I think that uh, is why I started to pursue it because I became interested because I saw the linkage there between my prior background, but then the need for how my prior background could help implement lean and OE initiatives. <clears throat> um, Trisha is looking for lean specific certifications, not Six Sigma belt certifications. Should I focus on OE rather than Six Sigma? You know, from my perspective, there are so many different certifications and programs out there. I think the most important thing, Trisha, is for you to take a look at what you want to learn. You know, see what that certification is really about. Dig a little bit. See who's had it before. Ask them a little bit about the curriculum, what you'd be studying, that sort of thing, to figure out if that's really what meets your needs and, and the needs of your organization. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of... <laughs> In, in our OE program at, at St. Vincent, you can actually earn uh, a Six Sigma Green Belt through studying with us. Uh, but we're working on putting together some additional certifications that are not really Six Sigma focused as well. And I remember um, when we started doing this, a colleague of mine at a different university said, um, oh, what, you're OE. Why are you doing a Green Belt course? That's, that's, you shouldn't do that. Those are two different things. Yeah, I mean... In, in a way, yes, but in a way, no. I mean, the whole idea is to improve, right? Yeah, Six Sigma is more statistically focused on quality than OE is. Our approach to OE is more focused on culture, perhaps, than, than Six Sigma is. But there are different ways to get to the same outcome, I think. And so, you know, what I said to him was, I don't want to limit our students in our master's program one way or the other. If they're all kind of in the same ballpark uh, in terms of the outcomes, in terms of, you know, we want to improve our organizations. We want to minimize waste then let's give uh, our students multiple ways to think about do, to do this, multiple approaches to doing this. And so, 
you know, um, Trisha, if, if both interest you, go for both. Uh, and Kathy is putting in a, a website there to, to get a flavor for what's out there. Great. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Um, take a look at what, what they're, uh, you know, what they're teaching and what they're, what, what is covered in those certifications. And certainly if you want to hear more about what we're doing here at St. Vincent, I'd be happy to, to share with you a little bit about that. If you want to reach out to me. Well, I believe that is all the questions that we have so far. So um, thank you again, Michael, for joining us and for facilitating today's webinar. Thank you for everybody who attended. Just a reminder, you will receive the recording within 24 to 48 hours. And everybody, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Bye. everybody.